So I want to just run through with you a few ideas that have really kind of been the backdrop of um, what I believe as a teacher and some of the ideas behind the book that we have here. None of these will be particularly new or original. I'm not standing here as a, an expert telling you things you don't know. Uh, this is just a list of things that have struck me over the years as being important. Children have a natural curiosity and openness to the world around them. Again, if you have kids of your own, you know that. They ask you endless, impossible questions that you cannot answer. Is that true? Yes. <laughs> but they have that amazing curiosity, and that's fantastic in a classroom to try and channel that. Oh, I'm too soon. They have a natural aptitude to language acquisition. We'll talk a bit about that in a minute. But they don't have highly developed linguistic skills or cognitive skills yet. They don't really have a framework for understanding language. So how do they learn? We don't know. It's all theory. They see and understand in the here and now. It's all about me now and the thing I want. So if it's a toy or a TV program or a suite, it's all about now. And they don't really want to be told that maybe they can have it later or come back to it another time. And it's a very physical and emotional understanding as well. I think it's important <clears throat> for young children to feel secure in their learning environment. And I think there's probably two aspects to that. To feel secure in terms of uh, the classroom environment, having pictures and objects that are child-centered in the classroom. But also, they should feel secure by not being put into um, a situation that they're going to feel uncomfortable or they're not ready for. So although I do believe very strongly in an active discovery kind of a, a classroom environment, <clears throat> I don't think it's right to put children under pressure to talk or respond before they're ready. I think that's really important. There are other ways that they can demonstrate learning and understanding um, silently. So I think that's a really important thing to, to do, be aware of. When I was um, visiting classes in Asia in particular, lots of teachers said to me that they felt it was important that materials that we use for teaching English with little ones should also equip them to express their needs, their physical needs, their social needs, and their emotional needs. Um, I'll come back to that a bit in, in a little while, actually, but um, I think that fits in quite importantly with the core curriculum of their kindergarten, where they will be learning how to express their needs um, clearly. And yes, so social norms, very important. Things like turn taking, sharing, saying sorry, um, all these acceptable, accepted norms in society that uh, we need to teach children. They don't always do these things naturally. I have a nearly 17-year-old, and he still sometimes forgets some of these things. I'm not sure they learn it very quickly. <clears throat> um, I've just dropped a little quote there from Piaget again. This, this age group, this two to seven year age group, which has been identified by many linguists and um, educational uh, psychologists as being a, a very key and important, I think it's called the pre-operational stage. Does anyone know their Piaget? Is that correct? Um, but he said that, that thinking at this age is still basically egocentric. Children still, their world is still about them. They don't really have much awareness beyond their own immediate circumstances. Uh, they'll know about the school that they go to, the shops they visit with their parents, and the, cl the clubs they go to, their friends' houses, but they don't really understand the, the wider community. And I think we have to bear that in mind. And they have difficulty taking the viewpoint of others. Again, I think if we've got kids of our own, we know that. They won't be reasoned with sometimes. So thinking about what children need. Gosh, there's a question. What do children need? Again, I'm not an expert, and I'm not going to try and claim this is an exhaustive list. But as teachers, I think these are relevant points. They do need to have their imaginations nurtured. We don't need to teach them to have an imagination. They have it. But there's a lot we can do to encourage them to use their imagination in imaginative play, perhaps with puppets uh, and toys, with role plays, 
um, things that we do naturally anyway with our own children, I think we should be doing in the classroom. They need humour and uh, touches of fantasy as well. And lots of variety. We hear this a lot when we're talking about the young learner classroom. Um, very important to have plenty of changes of pace during the course of a lesson. You need your crazy, wild, run around, throw yourself on the floor moments. Um, children actually do need to be active like that. But they also need quiet time. They need to be contemplative and be able to sit and look at a book or um, paint or do things like that, play with puzzles and blocks. So mixed input, very important. But children do need an active learning environment. They're the active participants. They should be exploring, experimenting, questioning, searching, discovering. And this is really the root of, of child-centered learning. Another thing that was often said to me um, <clears throat> when I was visiting schools in Asia was that teachers wanted to see content, wanted to see books from us publishers that reflected, supported, and reinforced the core curriculum that they were trying to cover within the kindergarten where the children are attending. So, um, in a sense, learning English is almost a secondary goal, really, with, with young children. There are basics that they need to be learning, and we can be supporting that through their English class. So, I've tried in the materials I've published over the years to include for, for small children something on uh, learning healthy and positive personal and social habits and routines. Might sound a little bit um, highbrow to be doing that kind of thing or a bit strange, but I think it's actually really important. Children need to learn to respect themselves, respect others, and very importantly, have a positive self-image and they should be age-appropriate. All materials that we use for children should be age-appropriate. They should match the cognitive stage of the child. We shouldn't be asking them to do tasks that they, they really can't manage yet. They haven't reached that cognitive stage. And the core of child-centered learning, that we, in the classroom, we should be focused on the child as the learner, not on the teacher as the deliverer of the information. The teacher is the facilitator and we need to stay focused on the child. They're, they're not just sponges to absorb everything we throw at them. They need to discover things for themselves. I think that's quite important. I talked earlier about um, children being egocentric, not in a bad way. I think that word's often used in a negative way. I don't mean it in a negative way. Um, but basically, it is the world of me, my family, my home, my toys, my pets, my school, my feelings and my needs. Um, and I think we need to reflect that in the materials that we produce. We need to keep the context firmly rooted in the child's limited world. So we've looked at some of the unique characteristics and special challenges that we face when teaching young children. But despite these limitations, young children can have a very positive first experience of English if we as facilitators supply the right environment and context for them that will inspire and engage them. I'm not going to say too much about linguistic theory because I want to get on and show you the book, but um, I think it's interesting just to pick up on a couple of things. Piaget noted that uh, uh, children indeed from the age of two to seven, this is the time they learn language. Apparently Einstein commented on this and said, it is a genius who has managed to make this incredible pronouncement that children learn uh, language before the age of seven. So they can do this, but they can't think logically. They should experiment and make mistakes, and that's all part of an active learning environment. And um, something else that's interested me, I, I know the theories of Chomsky have been challenged um, many times since the 1950s when he first came out with these ideas, but, and largely his theories have been applied to first language learning, but um, his theory, which I've always found interesting, <clears throat> relates to something called it's a hypothetical idea of the language acquisition device, or the LAD, where a child is born with an innate mechanism for uh, learning language. It's like a predisposition to acquiring language in this hypothetical part of the brain. And this endows young children with the capacity to derive language rules despite the 
flawed and um, often inconsistent input they get from the adults around them. They still somehow manage to, by the age of seven, basically be able to speak. And I think we can apply <coughs> that to second language acquisition as well, to some extent. They do have this immense capacity. So I've shared with you some of the, my own personal experiences and ideas and principles that I drew on when uh, in planning the book. We wanted to ensure when we started our conversations uh, about it that the content of the dictionary was going to engage and captivate small children through its charming visuals, familiar contexts, and I'll refer to that a lot over the next 10 minutes, appealing characters and touches of fantasy and humour, and very importantly, um, as I remember doing with those um, classes in Sweden, we did a lot of songs. It's not just children who love doing songs. I think it's a really great way to get your um, students involved and communicative and meaningful activities. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'd like to take you into the book now and show you some examples of how we've tried to reflect some of these elements in the content. So if you want to look at your handouts, if you haven't already, I won't necessarily be showing you all those pages, but Let's just whiz into it. <coughs> so, uh, we decided to have some um, child characters who would present, in a sense, the content of every page. They're either the active participants of what's happening on the page, or they're the observers, and uh, we hope that children will identify with them. They're not from anywhere in particular, but they've got their little friend, Kiki the monkey, who gets up to bits of mischief here and there on the page. So we've concluded lots of familiar contexts that children will relate to. This is a good example of how a typical page looks. We've got a main visual here where the key uh, items of vocabulary are labelled. In the bilingual editions, you would also see the translation on the page under the English word. Um, so we've got Ben and Daisy there in class with their teacher, and there's Kiki out in the tree behind with his own book, having his lesson out there. And underneath the main picture um, is the song. There's a song for every single page. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> with little mini visuals, either showing actions or helping to explain the meaning of the song. And then on the left side of the page is a little activity box with a find the hidden object task, which children absolutely love and uh, will enjoy doing again and again. <clears throat> so I think on this one, it's find the hidden birthday cake. I have no idea. Oh, yes, there it is. Can anyone see it? Probably not clear enough. Well, I'd shout it out. Yes, yeah, it's on the bookshelf. There it is. It's hidden away. It's a bit clearer in the, on the page than it is here. So familiar context, the classroom, Family meals, I think it's important that um, vocabulary must be contextualised and it must be relevant to the child's experience of that vocabulary. So I've put all the uh, food words into a meal context. I think that's really important. Family outings, little trip to the beach. And day-to-day -day activities like going to the supermarket with a parent or, in this case, with grandpa off to the park. <clears throat> I talked a little earlier about reflecting the child's world, the world of me. So we've actually, in a lot of the headings on the pages, we've used the word my to really ground it in the child's experience. So my family, at home, my pets, my day. This is an interesting one. Um, we had a debate, I hope my editor won't mind me mentioning this, but we had a debate early on about... Um, abstract concepts like um, time and days of the week and months of the year. And I think this is a tricky one to do with young children because they don't have a frame of reference. Um, so my suggestion was that certainly for time, time should be rooted for a four or five-year-old in what happens at that time rather than it's eight o'clock. I'm sure you agree. So on this page, for example, I've just picked out a couple of pictures. You know, it's time to get up. It's time for school. It's story time, it's home time, it's bath time, it's bedtime. So they begin to understand the concept of time 
without needing to know how to tell the time. So it's much more child-centred and rooted in their experience. And uh, bedtime, my bedtime, and picking up on what I said before about healthy routines. So here we've got, you know, have a shower and uh, clean my teeth and brush my hair and go to the toilet. Very important that we teach these phrases. And uh, even more important, washing my hands after I've been to the toilet. Um, and getting into bed, saying goodnight, all those sort of positive, affirming routines that happen in a child's day. We have uh, some pages which are not thematic as such, they're not based in a scene or a context, but children still need to know these things, so there's a little numbered chart there, um, teaching numbers to ten, using some of the vocabulary from the book. Uh, an alphabet chart, that's always a contentious one. Some teachers of, of young learners are very against teaching the alphabet too early. Um, yes, I mean, it, it's a difficult one. They do, children will always want to learn the alphabet and parents always want children to know their alphabet. So I think we probably as teachers do have to do it. My own approach is, is usually much more phonetic. I tend to go for a more phonics-driven approach where they would associate the sound of the letter with the object. So we'd have a, ant, b, b, k, cat. But uh, it's useful to have the alphabet chart there. Colours, the primaries, plus they can begin to get the idea how colours come together to make new colours. So that would be an interesting um, topic for a teacher to talk about with the children and for them to get their own paints out and actually have a go at mixing their colours. So another way we can support the core curriculum of the kindergarten, that they would be learning these things. I've called this, this a slightly less interesting topic. By that I mean um, the weather, really, children and weather. It's not interesting unless it relates to their own experience with weather. So for weather, I've included child-centred activities. So they're playing in the snow, they're kicking around in the rain, nice uh, sunny day bike ride flying the kite, sit, Kiki's sitting out there gasping in the heat with his drink, and then the kids are stuck inside because it's stormy. <clears throat> so I think it's important, rather than just having icons of weather, let's put the kids into the weather situation and see um, how the weather impacts on their lives. That's the thinking behind that. And also the impact that has on the clothes they wear. So obviously these are hot weather clothes, cold weather clothes, and um, again, picking up on what I was saying about supporting the um, core curriculum of, of early years, foundation years, very important that children learn to uh, express their emotions, part of their personal development. So we've tried to go for, I was going to say a realistic context, so I don't think in real life many monkey friends would break your toy. Uh, but anyway, let's take a little bit of license on that one. Uh, he's broken Ben's toy and he's very sorry, so the teacher can talk about saying sorry. Uh, and Ben's mad and he's allowed to be, he's angry, he has a right. Again, we need to allow children, these are real emotions, let's let them express them. And the teacher can talk about making up, saying sorry. Um, and poor Ben there, he's all sad about his toy. And here we've got uh, a storm going on and he's scared. So that's the little picture to teach the word scared. And Daisy's feeling a bit shy there, hiding behind Mummy. Yes, again, going back to what we were saying about the child's world, uh, we have included a page on the wider community, that these would all be places that children would relate to. They would have visited the toy shop, the supermarket, the school. Um, it's not very clear here because it's far away, but it's perfectly clear on the page. The dentists, the doctors, and the library and the swimming pool. <clears throat> For topics which are um, very difficult to really root in the child's experience, like African animals, didn't really want to do zoos, we can't talk about Africa, it's just too wide a, a concept for them. Um, so we've taken a more fantasy and humour approach here, so we've got uh, the African animals out there doing their safari sports day, running around the track, and we've got the crocodile there keeping score and the uh, baboon is doing the weightlifting, the lion on the high jump sea creatures um, in the band and um, ocean creatures. We've got Ben and Daisy there out in the boat with Grandpa. 
And then, of course, important to have the real fairy tale element included as well with dragons and princesses and um, knights, etc. Mostly we've included nouns because that tends to be uh, what we focus on more with very young learners. But it's important they have some verbs that are relevant to their world. So obviously we've got eat, drink, walk, run, laugh, cry, hold hands, a little subliminal thing on road safety there. And some useful classroom game instructions, stand up, sit down, touch toes, all things that could be built into a game, Simon Says, or a song, or an activity that the teacher can do in the class. That last one, I'm not sure why it came out with a black bit behind, but it's not like that on the page. She's turning round. That's a fun one to do in a, a song in class. Um, and there are songs. We've just got time to listen to a song. Um, this is the birthday party page, where they're learning uh, party food, and then they have a song. So we'll just have a quick... Perhaps just the first time through, we don't need to do the whole thing. Sing the song. My birthday party. Are you ready for the party? Are you ready for the party? Presents, cards, balloons. Presents, cards, balloons. Two. Ice cream, water, fruit. Cake and sweets and popcorn too. Ice cream, water, fruit. Are you ready for the party? Are you ready for the party? Presents, cards, balloons. Presents, cards, balloons. song for every single page and they're very active and the children get, get up and dance and have fun with them and finally on the page I showed you at the beginning a little activity section where they find a hidden object which is different on every page all the things that the children have to find are words that they will have been taught at some point in the book but they don't actually need to know the name of the thing in order to um, to find the hidden object some activities like here we had counting candles and singing the song. So I'll wrap up now, but just finally to tell you that there are uh, 36 topics in the book, 36 spreads, and um, a word list of just over 300 words. The book is so far, I think, in eight or nine bilingual versions, is that correct? And more planned. <laughs>